Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're bringing you an epic story of science adventure. We're hunting for snapdragons. Wait, like dragons are real? No, I said snapdragons. They're a kind of flower. We're traveling to one magical spot in Spain where biologists search for snapdragons every summer. And we're going to find out why. When scientists study plants and animals in their natural environment, it's called fieldwork. A few of our listeners told us about the fieldwork they'd like to do. I would go to Alaska to study brown bears. I would study whales and how they originally came into the water from land. I would go to the place where they first began to enter the water and see if I could find fossils mid-stage between the land-dwelling animals and modern whales. The species of animal I would like to study is a musk ox and I would like to see it in the Arctic. I would study jaguars. I would like to learn why they have spots. I would like to study the blobfish because I think that they are very interesting. They live over 2,000 feet underwater, so I would need a submarine to try to study them. And I also want to know what they eat and what their big nose is used for. That was Clara, Liam, Parsa, Grady, and Grace. Those are all really cool projects that I would love to be involved with. I know, me too. And I can't believe that it's actually people's jobs to go out into nature and try to answer really interesting questions about species and ecosystems. (laughs) It's nice work if you can get it. Yeah, and as long as I've been a science journalist, I've really wanted to go out and experience field work for myself. Because so many awesome discoveries we hear about come from being out in the field. Also known as outside. Yeah. And what we usually don't hear about with all those cool discoveries about animals and plants is what it's actually like to do the work. So that's why this summer, I tagged along with a field crew on a mountain road near the border of France and Spain, hunting for snapdragons. Rawr. So does anyone want to describe where we are and where we're going? Like just what it looks like? Yeah. Okay, so we've pulled over by the side of this windy one-lane mountain road, and we're standing next to some train tracks. Uh, Around us are these beautiful hills covered in trees, and before the trees, there's areas that are just grassy and weedy and um, full of lots of wildflowers, and so that's where we're going to look for snapdragons. That's Karina Basket. She's an ecologist, and she'd just flown in from Michigan the day before to join the snapdragon hunt. I think we're doing our usual sampling, so we try to look at every single flowering plant of snapdragons in this area, and we want to know how big they are, like how they're doing, and we're collecting DNA to figure out how related they are to each other. Maybe you should describe what snapdragons look like, because I've actually never seen one in person. Well, they're the only flowers I know that have mouse and can talk. Like actually talk? (laughs) No. Do these ones speak Spanish? No, you can make them talk, though. You can kind of pinch the flower open at the base, and they snap open like a dragon's mouth, so you can make them go, hello. (laughs) (laughs) They're pretty common in gardens all over the world, but there's a reason that Karina has come this far to find them. Yeah, there's actually two roads where one end of the road is magenta flowers and the other is yellow and there's orange in between and that's happening on two different roads. So wait, is this some kind of magic trick that makes flowers change colors? It's not magic, it's science. Oh, I mean, I guess that makes sense. This isn't a magic podcast. (laughs) Yeah. The orange plants are hybrids. They're a mix between the yellow and magenta snapdragons. There are yellow flowers on one side and magenta flowers on the the other and in the hybrid zone they're mixing. The hybrid zone is a meeting and mixing place for two types of plants or animals that have gradually separated over thousands of years. They're not separate enough to be called separate species, but they rarely mix. 
In the case of these snapdragons, there's a patch of solid magenta and then a patch of solid yellow flowers. But in the middle, this hybrid zone, there's an explosion of colors, pinks, whites, and oranges. It's strange that there aren't just orange flowers everywhere. Like, why are they only in this small part in the middle? Well, that's really fascinating, but are all these people out here just to ask, why are there orange flowers? It's actually part of a much bigger question, not just about snapdragons, but all species in the entire world. By coming out here and collecting data on each snapdragon, ecologists like Karina can peek into exactly how plants become separate species. We know of a couple of other hybrid zones in the area, but uh, they're kind of hard to find and rare. This is a little laboratory you've chosen. Yeah, an outdoor laboratory. The field crew divided up into pairs, put on reflective vests, and we set off down the road. We kind of looked like a highway cleanup crew. That's not a snapdragon, is it? That yellow one? Yeah. No, actually, that's funny you say that because they're in the same family, and I keep seeing those and thinking, that looks kind of like a snapdragon, and it's not. Just then, another member of our crew with a trained eye spotted a real snapdragon. Very bottom. Oh, yeah, you're right. I see it. It's white. The chase begins. The good thing about hunting snapdragons is that they can't run. But it's kind of tough to get down the steep slope where they like to grow without falling. We climbed down along with Louise Arathun, another biologist who's been on the job for a few weeks. Should I show you how to use a trimble? Whichever job is easier to... I guess I need to... What's a uh, trimble? It's a tool that kind of looks like a super bulky yellow smartphone. Uh, So the trimble is what we use to get the GPS coordinates of the plants so we know exactly where they are in the hybrid zone and then put in the ID number that we put on each plant. It's connected to satellite so every time you find a plant you can pin it to a virtual map. Then they add the data that they collect out in the field. So it's just the height of the stem, the number of leaves, uh, the number of flowers and the number of stems. While Louise handles the trimble, Karina focuses on the plants. So these are pink on the edges. Do you call those lips? I don't know what the technical okay. term is. They're pink on the edges and yellow in the middle of the face. Karina pulled out the plastic bottle, which was labeled with the same code as the tag. Oh, there's a beetle in there. Should I leave it or take it out? Uh, you can leave it. Oh, poor little beetle. Karina dropped everything into the bottle to be analyzed later. And then you also take... Um, One big leaf as well for the photograph, and then for the DNA sampling, you take about three medium-sized leaves and about six little leaves. The entire process takes about 10 minutes, and when they finished, we headed back up the road to scout out our next flower. Oh, there's another one. (laughs) It's like an Easter egg hunt. But made by nature. It was an amazing way to spend the day, and I actually got a little jealous that the field crew would get to do the same thing for months. It was really cool. That is really cool, but I have one really big important question for you. Okay, shoot. I know you said earlier that this hybrid zone could be the key to understanding how one species becomes two, but why are so many people working on this one patch for nine years? That's a really, really good question. And I asked Karina the same thing. Why is it so necessary to go out and find each individual plant year after year after year? What's the point? What's cool about this hybrid zone and the reason that we're going out every year and finding every plant is that we're trying to build a pedigree. And so that's like building a family tree. A plant family tree, like, here's grandfather snapdragon. (laughs) (laughs) Just like a human family tree, a plant family tree helps biologists understand the relationships between individuals. So if they study it for nine years, they can go back nine generations. Which would be to a plant's great, 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 
Great. I actually lost count. <laughs> Grandparents. Exactly. And the reason why they're collecting information day after day, year after year, is because they have to build that family tree from scratch. If we didn't have any records, any birth certificates, and nobody knew who was related to who in humans, and you, you had to just go out and test everyone and, and get their DNA, that would be pretty crazy to think about, right? To, to know who your parents were. And so that's what we have to do for these plants. Oh my gosh, that is crazy. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but what is this family tree going to be able to tell us when it's finished? It can tell us how many children or offspring each plant had. Did that plant have a bunch of offspring because of the flower color? Was it because of something else? Like, could it be the weather or the soil or, like, maybe how many bees or what kind of bees visit the plants? Yeah, exactly. So we know that the magenta snapdragons and the yellow snapdragons have the most children. But why don't the other colors have as many children? What's going on? If we know that whole pedigree, then we can start to ask those questions. And that's really unique. It's important because if we want to understand how plants become separate species, we need to ask a lot of little questions about the process before we can ask the big question. It's really not even clear, like, why do we have different plants? No, that's not clear at all. And especially when you think about, like, in the tropical rainforest, you can have a thousand tree species in the area of 30 football fields. That's more than the number of tree species in all of North America, which is 620. Oh, so why are there so many different species in one place and not in another? Yeah, that's totally it. How does it happen? Such a big question, and we still don't really know the answer. Oh man, I can't believe that this little patch of roadside that you were on might help answer that huge question. I know. <laughs> That's why I keep saying it's so cool. <laughs> But it starts with investigating small questions. So that's why on her very first day, Karina was trying to figure out what questions she's going to be asking and how. So that's what I'm going to do with um, the insects that eat the plants. Start, start measuring how much they're eating and who they are. So that'll be a new thing that I'll add. Okay, so everybody before has just been sort of picking the insects out and focusing on the flowers. And you're like, give me those insects. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Like the beetle she accidentally captured earlier, that's data. Yeah, Karina is really interested in the interactions between bugs and plants. She wants to know if those bugs contribute to this snapdragon's success or failure. There's so many variables. And that's what makes fieldwork so important. There's just no way you could study all these interactions in nature in a lab. It's a natural laboratory. It's like a laboratory that's guaranteed to have failed experiments. Well, all laboratories are guaranteed to have failed experiments, so it's like any laboratory. There's a lot of failure in science, but that's how we learn. Our time in the field was just the first part of the process. After we found all the snapdragons that were in bloom, Karina spent the afternoon learning how to analyze them, with DNA, organizing them, taking photographs, so many steps. So that later they can have all that information. Yeah, and she'll spend the rest of the year finding answers to those questions she's curious about. And ultimately, when the family tree is complete, scientists all over the world will be able to test broad ideas about all species using hundreds of thousands of data points. So learning about snapdragons could help us like understand why there are so many trees in the rainforest and why there's three species of ants in your backyard instead of just one. <laughs> exactly. So these snapdragons on the side of the road are part of a huge puzzle. Each flower we tagged that day is a tiny little step towards understanding how the world works a little better. One tiny step for a snapdragon, one great leap forward for humankind. I mean, the snapdragons aren't going anywhere, but... I guess they don't step. Yeah, we need to work on that metaphor. <laughs> We have tons of photos of snapdragons, the field crew, and even a photo of me recording this story on our blog at sciencepodcastforkids.com slash blog. Plus, you can find out what other scientists do in the field 
and how you can someday spend your summer doing field work. And we want to hear from you. Where would you like to go in the field and what would you study? Draw us a picture of you out in the field studying cheetahs, grass, blobfish, whatever, and then send it to us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. We have so many people to thank who helped out with this story. First of all, Karina Basket, Nick Barton, Louise Arathun, Lenka Mateyovakova, and Melinda Pickup at the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria, David Field at the University of Vienna, and the rest of the field crew. And super special thanks to Haley Gillespie, who came along for this great adventure. Also thanks to Liam, Grace, Grady, Clara, and Parsa for sending us the recordings and amazing fieldwork project ideas. Grady and Clara have their own podcast called Cool Facts About Animals. Really? That's awesome. It's amazing. Check it out on the Kids Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the first episode of our fourth season. And our Patreon supporters are a big, big reason that we're able to keep making this show. So we want to give a very special shout out to our newest patron, Chael, who's pledging for his birthday. Chael, thank you so much. Anyone can pledge for any occasion at patreon.com slash humble podcast. If you can't join us on Patreon right now, you can help out by telling five of your friends about Tumble. They will thank you for it. Sarah Lentz is our editor. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this show. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I make all the music. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery. Mm-hmm.